But we're going to go through and talk about innate hemp tonight. We're going to go through and talk about the difference between hemp and cannabis, but I want to break down some of the whole mysteries with the whole system. You happen to have an endogenous endocannabinoid system in your body, which is really a the, probably the biggest... It is. You have more neurotransmitters for uh, cannabinoids than you do any other nerve receptor in the body. So that's why it's super important for us to balance that system. It's essential to everything. It's basically what it does. It can take you out of parasympathetic or put you take you out of sympathetic and put you in parasympathetic, so you can relax, sleep, eat, forget all the things that you need to do. Uh, so let's go through this stuff. But I'm going to do a little quick history. I mean, we've been using uh, cannabis back as far as recorded history goes. It's not only been used medicinally, but it's been used ceremonially and religions, and it's also been used recreationally. But up until the time of Prohibition in 1937, which we had the Tax Act, which I'm going to talk about and why we had that and why it was vilified, it was used a lot in health and healing. And again, I kind of get kind of, I'm over the thing with the term, uh, you know, plant-based medicine. Let's call it plant-based health care is the way I like to look at it. Uh, Glad to see we've got Yvonne Mitchell out there, Tracy Yanati. Thank you, Tracy, for being there. And Penny Bright. Everybody else, if you could show some love, send some hearts my way. Uh, but there was powers that be. One of the biggest powers that be was uh, William Hearst. He was back in the day in California. He uh, was pretty much owned a lot of the forestry, and he was big in the paper industry. And not only the paper industry, but he also owned newspapers, so he used that to vilify... Uh, cannabis, and we'll get to all the other industries that really uh, were out to really vilify cannabis because it, it, they wanted to monopolize is the, those industries and control. They didn't want to have hemp as a uh, competitor. So one of the ways they did this was they did this through using racism, which I mean, there's no way they would get away with any of this stuff today. But they basically said, I didn't say this because they know somebody misinterpreted me once that I said, no, I didn't say this. Uh, it was this cat, Henry J. Aslinger, who was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And what he basically said, Rafer, Reefer makes uh, the darkies think they're as good as, as white men. He also said that if you smoked it, you would go into this reefer madness craziness and all the different things that they were basically trying to vilify cannabis with and create this stigma that still to this day uh, kind of haunts this beautiful plant. Uh, so let's go over some of the simple things that... So all the sailing rigs in the past were made out of cannabis. I mean, you remember covered wagons that was, it, they were called... It was called canvas from cannabis. Fiber, paper, uh, rope, twine, cordage, art canvases, paints and varnishes, lighting oil, biomass energy. That's why, again, the, the petroleum cartel, medicine, therapeutic. It's also a great food, like I'll get to in a little bit. It's the most probably complete plant-based protein that there is. They're using uh, hemp now for uh, this stuff called hempcrete, which they're building houses with it. You can use it for the biomass. They can, you can grow more biomass on one acre of land with cannabis in three months, the growing season, than you can in 20 years on four acres with wood. That's how this, this is the most magnificent plant that can extract the energy from the sun and take it and turn it into living food for human beings. But also it's got so many attributes that I'm going to get to in a minute. All right. So... Also, again, I also say if we really opened up the floodgates on legalization of farmers growing this, it's going to be a huge boon, not only for farmers, but industry overall when with the stigma goes away. But again, we have these huge forces in medicine, the pharmaceutical cartel, the paper industry, cotton. It's so, so much better fabric than cotton, and it doesn't need anywhere near the amount of pesticides and herbicides that is so typically used to raise cotton. And it also, hemp has a way of also rejuvenating the soil, getting toxins out, but it also help us with our carbon debt that we have because it will take that carbon dioxide and turn it into life-giving oxygen. 
All right, yeah, the reefer madness thing. Yeah, if you smoke that stuff, you're going to go friggin' mental and crazy. Again, I sometimes say, you know, I think if more people use cannabis, we'd have a lot less war on the planet, a lot more peace and love. But again, I come from the hippie days, the 70s. All right, so let's talk about one of the big things that I hear a lot, a lot is everybody goes, well, dude, you know, this, the CBD and hemp, is it the same that it is in, in, in cannabis or marijuana? That's the term. They also use the worm, term marijuana to vilify even further because they took two Hispanic names. One is Mary and the other one's Juana, and they put it together to get, create more mystique about this dangerous plant. Uh, but again, I mean, I remember growing up and hearing all this stuff, and I, you know, I thought you know, if you ever did it, you would go crazy. But I, like I said, what it does is it really kind of opens up your mind so you can see more. I don't want to get into the aspect. I always want to talk about the medicinal aspects of it, but there's, Again, I want people to understand there's CBD in both hemp and marijuana, and they both really, so hemp is basically grown for its biomass. It's also grown for its cordage. I mean, again, this is more industrial. And then marijuana, or what is typically known as what people smoke, is going to be a smaller, shorter plant. Uh, but it's going to have a higher level of THC. And this has very little THC in it. It's like 0.3% typically or less. This now today has been hybridized to a point where some plants have upwards of 27 to 30% THC. And what I think, that in my opinion, both those plants are the same plant. It's just cannabis sativa. That's like there's dogs, but you've got a dachshund versus a Great Dane. You know what I'm saying? So there's differences in dogs, but it's still cannabis sativa. But what we've done through hybridization over the years is hemp typically has higher levels of CBD. And CBD is the molecule that we're going to get the most benefit from as far as health is concerned. And then the THC molecule is the one where you get the psychoactive part of it. That's the one that you know everybody vilifies this plant with. And marijuana is typically going to be low in CBD and high in THC. But what I try to teach people is that when I was growing up as a kid back in the 70s, most recreational marijuana in those days had probably two to three, four percent THC levels. And what we've done since it became illegal is we really condensed the packaging. So now, you know, when you buy a certain amount of pot, it's going to have a higher level of THC in it just because of for packaging reasons and just because they've learned how to hybridize it. And what we're starting to see now is they're starting to hybridize it back to the way it used to be because so many people are looking for a strain that is low in THC, because a lot of people don't want to get high, they don't want the psychoactive effect, they're looking for the CBD effects. But also, as I always say, when we talk about the entourage effect, the plant was made perfectly by God, every constituent. That's why you should have a little bit of THC in whatever tincture or sublingual you're doing or whatever plant that you're utilizing because that synergistic effect of all those different chemicals in there is gonna raise that level. Now, the only time you don't wanna have any THC in it, and we have a formula without it, is if you're getting blood tested at work, whether you're working for the government or any type of entity where they do regular blood testing. <clears throat> all right, if you guys got questions, go ahead and throw them at me, but I'm gonna kinda of get through this as fast as I can. All right, so that's my backyard. Finally, it's legal in California. Uh, which it should be. And I've never understood the uh, double standard, the uh, just hypocrisy with, I mean, well, alcohol is legal and you know, this isn't. I mean, this to me is way safer. And anybody that's done both knows. And I'll tell you that right now, at least for me. All right. Uh, so here's one of my favorite tinctures. I actually, I juiced the, uh, the cannabis uh, leaves and then some turmeric. And that's the best anti-inflammatory on the planet. It'll blow anything else out of the water. You can give somebody with rheumatoid that, and it'll really get rid of a lot of their issues. Uh, and I posted this yesterday. This was a, a kale and cannabis salad that I had yesterday. And people asked me, what does the cannabis taste like? It tastes like chicken. No, 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 it tastes like arugula. So I put some avocados in there, hemp seeds. I put bean sprouts in there, blueberries. And then I made this killer dressing. There's a lot of other stuff in there, but I don't need to get in that depth. But I made some uh, hemp oil and uh, lemon vinaigrette, some balsamic vinegar. And let me tell you what, you can't find this kind of food on the road. I'm on the road a lot, and I love eating at home. Then I made a nice killer juice with spirulina. So 
The other thing I try to get you to understand is that when you juice it, there's no psychoactive effects. When you eat it raw, you the, the cannabis has to be heated to decarboxylate the THC acid form that makes it go to delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. And that's the active ingredient. But again, it has to be heated above 270 degrees to activate that molecule to create the psychoactive effects. So that's why juicing it, eating it raw, has huge benefits, okay? Uh, and again, you're not smoking it on top of it. And we're going to talk about alternatives to smoking as well. So there's the raw forms, which we have the acids, this, this THCA, the CBDA, the CBDCA, and that changes all these to THC, to CBD. So again, we have heated and we have raw forms. So this would be the green tube. This would be the gold tube. And then there's the age. This would be obviously when it's been overly oxidized. This would be like when we were growing up as kids, they had stuff called dirt weed. It was probably just a Mexican variant of pot that was very brown and it was horrible. Uh, I can tell you stories about that, but we don't need to go there tonight. And again, the, 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 the THC levels in the products that we have, are they have to legally be under 0.3%, which would be the equivalent, equal to. Let's not say that word. I, I have a hard time with that word always because I talk too fast. Would be equal to drinking a non-alcoholic beer. There's 0.5% alcohol in a non-alcoholic beer. There's 0.3%. And most of the, the, uh, the products that we have have been tested usually are under 0.09%. And the thing is, the CBD will mitigate the effects of THC. So if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, you're really not even going to get high with that. So... Again, a lot of people have the concern and fear that the THC is going to get them high. It will not, and any of our products will not get you high, but there has to be some THC in there, again, to get that synergistic effect. The only time we don't use that is when we have somebody that is being blood tested on a regular basis. So let's go over the different constituents. So there's not only CBD, which has all these huge benefits. It's a vasorelaxant, so it's great for blood pressure. It's great for the eyes. It treats psoriasis, it's tranquilizing, muscle spasm. I mean, you can look at all this stuff. Uh, antibacterial, inhibits cancer cells, it's neuroprotective. That's one of the main reasons I like it. It's also neuroregenerative. It's flying in the CalJam jet right now. Seizures, it's great for that. It helps, like I did a diabetes workshop, it's great for sugar levels. It helps the function of the new. What it does is it just balances your body. And the endocannabinoid system really modulates every other system, including your nervous system, your immune system, Every other system is controlled by this. And again, then we have all these other, there's CBDA, there's CBG, there's CBGA, all these different, there's 80 different cannabinoids in the typical cannabis plant that all have a varying role. So that's what I want to teach you. Medicine's going to come along and they're going to synthesize a CBD compound and they're going to make it so that this will be the only thing that you can buy. But the problem when you do this, see God made this perfect package for us and then what medicine does is they think they can take one of the active ingredients out, change this molecular structure, then what they can do is patent and then they're gonna force you to take it. But all these synthetic versions have horrific side effects because they don't have everything else in it to balance it out. There's a lot of other things that go into, the, well, that I'll get to. Your body also has its own endogenous cannabinoid system. It means it produces things like 2-AG, which is 2-arachidonyl glycerol, and anandamide, which are chemicals that your body makes, but due to just stress and electrosmog and chemical smog and, and, and everything in our environment, and the fact that we don't grow it everywhere and the animals don't eat it, we're not getting as much cannabin cannabinoids in our diet and we have what was, is called an endocannabinoid deficiency. Just like you would have a vitamin C deficiency, i.e. scurvy, you take vitamin C for that. So I just want you to understand it's in human breast milk. It's very prevalent in the human body. And what our objective with the phytocannabinoids coming from a plant is, is that it helps balance that system out. And what it does is, like I said, it takes you out of sympathetic fight or flight. And that's why it allows you to relax, sleep, digestion, really everything in your body, even it can help prevent things like osteoporosis. Uh, but it shifts us from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Mainly we have two CBD or CB receptor, cannabinoid receptors in the body, a CB1 and a CB2. CB1 is mostly found in the brain and nervous system. CB2 is mostly in the gut. 
and in your immune system. So again, we would want to target either one of those systems depending on what you've got going on uh, as far as your health is concerned and where you, you need the most balancing of that endocannabinoid deficiency, okay? Uh, I already talked about that. Let's talk about the difference of, because again, there's going to be situations where people need THC to get the beneficial results, okay? And, the, and there's not many of those conditions, but uh, CBD is not psychoactive. It's alerting in low doses, which again, maybe not wor won't work for you if you have sleep issues. It works for me, but I'm gonna show you what you're gonna do in a minute. It reduces pain, reduces muscle spasm. It's a huge, potent anti-inflammatory, and we know most diseases because people spend most of their life in a pro-inflammatory state. Stops nausea and vomiting. That's why it's great for people that are doing chemo. I would prefer that they would do a more alternative uh, protocol first. But again, that's up to you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you to do your research before you jump on that whole chemo bandwagon. This for me is the biggest one, anxiety. My brain never shuts up, so that's what I use it for. It helps with depression. Uh, and it's also an antioxidant and neuroprotectant. And not only is it a neuroprotectant for your brain, it also helps regenerate. It's a neuroregenerative. It helps regenerate new nerve cells. Uh, whereas THC is the molecule, it's delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, is the one that passes the uh, brain barrier and creates the psychoactive effects. It's very sedating and relaxing. Again, it's going to be dependent on whatever strain that you're in. I'll talk about strains in a little bit. It helps stop nausea. It stimulates appetite. The funny thing was, and when I did my diabetes workshop last week, we noticed that people that were regular users of uh, cannabis had lower incidence of diabetes, obesity, which to me seems kind of odd because I, we know that smoking pot sometimes can cause the munchies. Uh, reduces anxiety as well. Again, there's going to be certain strains which increase anxiety for some people. If anybody's been there, you know what I'm talking about. And reduces depression also has anti-tumor effects. So again, if somebody's looking to deal with something like something as extreme as cancer, it might be beneficial for them to use a low dose THC strain that will give them those beneficial effects. But again, as I tell people, the products we have legally cannot be sold unless they have less than 0.3% THC in it. So you may need to supplement some THC in there. I will get to that in a minute. I know everybody's just dying to know. <clears throat> So there's 80 different cannabinoids in there. There's all these different terpenes that are in there, limonene, carophylline, linalool, myrcene, and these, that's what gives cannabis its very pungent odors and different odors. They all have different smells to them because they have different varying uh, profiles as far as not only the terpenes, but also all those different cannabinoids are in there. But then we also have the different bioflavonoids in there which also have health properties, not medicinal properties. Again, they're antioxidants, anti-cancer. So this, I want people to understand this is not like some drug. What it is, it's a superfood that God gave to us that helps balance the system that's already in our body, that brings about better homeostasis and healing, and also prevents cancer, in my opinion, from the research that I've done, prevents things like Alzheimer's, if it's neuroprotective, neuroregenerative, it prevents things like diabetes, osteoporosis, by balancing those systems. It bumps up the immune system. All this happens just because of the fact that we have all these different constituents. There's 480 different molecules within the cannabis plant, and they all play an important role, and they also have a synergistic effect, like I talked about, an entourage effect that gives cannabis as a whole plant, not as a, you don't extract one molecule out of it and then synthesize it, make it into it. It just, God doesn't work that way, neither does your human body. So let's talk about different strains now. The different strains that are out there, like this strain right here is called an ACDC strain, which is super low in THC and it's super high in CBD. You will probably not get any type of psychotropic effect on this because even at one to one ratios, and this is like 20 to one ratio, even higher than that, you're not gonna, it's, this is, CBD is gonna mitigate or negate the effects of THC. And so if you're looking to put some THC into the formulas that we have, I would uh, say augmenting that with maybe a strain like this and you would need to vaporize that. Whereas you got a strain like Blue Dream where you're, you're gonna have super high levels of uh, THC and very little to no CBD in it. So you're gonna wanna stay away from strains like that. 
These are strains that are typically meant for people that are getting high. And again, over the years, what we've done is hybridize more and more of the plants to have higher levels of THC and because we were never really looking for CBD, but now everybody's looking for CBD. So you look for a strain that's high like this one, or this one too is canatonic. There's also a strain that I have at home, which is really good for me for sleep, is a canacopia. This again has a 30 to one ratio of CBD to THC. You will not get high, but it, again, is good for sleep. And this would be good to supplement with this, the TH, or the CBD products that we sell through Innate Hemp. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to skip this slide. We already covered it all on that. So let's just talk about some of the things that uh, CBD, I mean, you can go to the National Institute of Health Studies. There's more studies on this plant than probably any other plant on the product, on the planet. And again, a lot of it, was, they did studies that to, to show that smoking cannabis causes lung cancer and they found the exact opposite. They found that people that smoked it actually had lower incidence of cancer. And they even had a group where they smoked cigarettes and smoked cannabis. Those people even had lower incidence of uh, lung cancers. So that's one of the reasons, I, I mean, I, I'm not just jumping on the cannabis bandwagon. I've been on the bandwagon since I was 16 years old, okay? Uh, obviously I wasn't into, the, into it for the medicinal effects as a kid or the health benefits, because I didn't even know about that. It's just until we really discovered this body, the body's endocannabinoid system that we really started to understand how important it was to augment and supplement your body with phytocannabinoids. However you get them, you can get them through tinctures, you can get them, we've got different pastes and oils that we use. You can put those into your smoothies. You can, I mean, I put the, the tinctures under my tongue every night before bed. You can eat it in a salad like I did. You can juice it. You can, I'm, I'm a big fan of vapor, vaporizing it. You use a vaporizer and you basically inhale, basically just CBD, oil vapors, and you're also gonna get all the terpenes and bioflavonoids in that as well. So you got everything from, it's great for pain, again, that would end the opioid epidemic, mitochondrial function for energy, migraines, depression, PTSD. In fact, I gotta do a consult on this for a vet on the, on the phone right after we get done here. He's been on all types of pharmaceutical drugs. Again, these vets come back, they get typical care at the, vet, at the, uh, <clears throat> at the VA, and that's usually just pharmaceutical drugs, cardiovascular disease. Again, if you take somebody out of sympathetic, you're gonna lower a lot of incidence of cardiovascular disease. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. Next week, uh, I'm doing an autism workshop. I'll show you why it works great for autism as well, especially chilling these kids out. HIV, osteoporosis, asthma. Uh, you got, I mean, it's big. For, I mean, you do tons of studies on cancer, depression, nausea, it's also very aggressive against breast cancer, leukemia, brain cancer, glioblastoma, which I mean, you're gonna see a lot more of that too coming up with all the use of cell phones. <clears throat> uh, and it's also a great antioxidant. So I'm gonna give you a couple books. I've read probably 30 different books on the subject because I, in fact, I got a new book I'm excited to read tonight from Michael Pollan who did The Omnivore's Dilemma about the positive aspects of microdosing psilocybin. Again, I want people to understand that we grew up with all these different plants in a biosphere. We, you know, we were affected by the plants and now we live in these concrete jungles. We have carpet on the ground. We've got paint on the walls. We live in these shacks made out of uh, you know, drywall and wires going through it. So again, we were more in tune to our environment. We lived amongst the plants and we were affected by the plants and we, you know, symbiotically work with these plants and now we've become so disconnected and detached. It's probably part of the reason that essential oils are so amazing. I mean, I've just discovered essential oils. I thought that was kind of, you know, I really didn't understand essential oils either until I started studying it. And that's really helped me with some of my sleep issues as well. Uh, some of the books I recommend, Bonnie Goldstein. This book is super easy to read. It goes through all the science of it. And then a book that I just recently purchased, which is awesome, is this book, Healing with Hemp Oil, A Simple Guide to Using. Now, in this book, the reason I like this book is it, it covers something that uh, is not covered in a lot of other books. It, it talks about, and I gotta be careful with my words here, because there's a you know big brother doesn't want you to say certain things, so I can't say those things. But let's call it your RDA, your recommended daily allowance. And in, in this book, they talk about starting out slow, which I which makes sense to me, especially if you're super sensitive, 
or you've never used cannabis before. Uh, so I would start out with like two or three milligrams of just cannabis for most conditions. But again, if you're talking more extreme conditions, you can take up to 300 to 700 milligrams of CB with no adverse effects because like with, with opioids, the opioids affect your opioid receptors, which are your brain stem. That's what causes a lot of these people to stop breathing, but you don't have any CB cannabinoid receptors in your brain stem. So that's why this is such a much safer alternative than opiates, okay? Uh, but he goes through all the different conditions. So if you're looking at something like anxiety, you would want to start out slow and then raise it up. I've also heard people say start at 15 milligrams and work up. What's a good dose for health and wellness? I would probably say personally for me, I would say probably, and this is my opinion based on a lot of reading, I would say probably 15 milligrams twice a day. <clears throat> Kids probably half that. Uh, but get the book. It explains all, every condition in there, everything from heart disease, insomnia, to MS, to psoriasis, to stress, all those. And it gives you an exact, and usually most of them are three milligrams to five milligrams, and then slowly titrate up your level so you get the desired results, whatever you're looking for, okay? And then I'm gonna finish with this, and if anybody's got questions, I will stay on here. We got 34 people here. I'm excited that you guys showed up tonight. Would you guys give me just some, like, those little love things that you send out, if you're still there? There's some hearts? Uh, maybe you can't do that. Maybe it's gonna come, I don't know. All right, so last but not least, because uh, the Wizard of Oz wants to go home, and I wanna go home and eat, too. It's been a long day. But I got some good waves, though, yesterday. Two sessions, you know. Oh, thank you, everybody. I love you guys. Uh, I love you so much. And thanks for being here. So if you guys, we got a free ebook. There's also a bunch of other articles we have on the website. Go to the website, and then you go in and you put your email in there. And uh, we're going to send you the ebook. It goes through a lot of the things I explained, and so you can read it on your own. I'm going to see if we can post this. Nick, we can take this and put this on in on uh, YouTube, right? Okay, so we'll put that on YouTube if you want to review anything. They can always share it too. And you guys can always share it. There's already been two shares. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I, Jeannie Vella says, I wish I could just get the raw leaves to eat in salads and smoothies. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where you live, but it should be legal. Steve Russo, I hit the enjoy by accident, but if I did get a good laugh, uh, thank you, Steve. All right, I'm going to sign off, but I just want to thank all you people for being on. I'm going to try to do more of these once a week. It's not just going to be in CBD. It will touch on other topics. But I also want you to know that we have the CalGMNetwork.org. You can go there. You can watch all the CalGAMs on there. It's like the Netflix for health. So it's not just for chiropractors, but it's a lot of chiropractic content for chiropractors. Uh, and we also want you to come to CalGM, calgm.org. Uh, we're already at 700 plus sales for next year. So that's good. I'm going to sleep really good this year. I don't have a lot of stress. But I want to thank you all for viewing today. Uh, and visit our website in innate. It's the letter N, the number 8, hemp.com. Signing off. Peace and love and cannabis, Billy D. Love, again, if more people use utilize cannabis, there'll probably be a lot more love and a lot less war. But, is that right? A lot less war, yeah. That's what I meant. All right. I'm tired. And I'm hungry. Signing off with love, Billy D.
that job, that job will take you for a dot. One zip is still the lot. When you smoke that kidney job. America is threatened by a new drug menace. Street corner vendors whose stock in trade is the deadly local weed marijuana pass it out in cigarette form. From ingeniously concealed containers, the reefers go to the waiting hands of deluded youngsters. I think hemp gets a bad rap in the media because it's too good. Hemp gets a bad rap in the media, frankly, because a lot of people, uh, they abuse it, right? It's just people are stupid. Right? Um, especially, frankly, young people. Uh, young people who get their hands on something that tweaks their, their brain uh, the same way as, as uh, you know, whatever, coffee or alcohol or tobacco or any of these other drugs that we use. Why I think hemp gets a bad rap in the media is because we've had years of this indoctrination like reefer madness. Laughter. condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. Also because of what I believe is pretty hefty pharmaceutical lobbying uh, to the feds to actually make hemp seem bad so they can make it illegal, so they can get a patent and make pharmaceuticals that are based on, of all things, hemp. Surprise. Uh, I think that's a big, big part of it too. It is a competition with the pharmaceutical industry. And the pharmaceutical lobby, most of the people think that the biggest lobby in the world is the oil lobby, and that's not true the pharmaceutical lobby actually is bigger than the oil lobby. In other words, pharmaceutical companies going to Washington, D.C., paying people to say, to do their bidding, to say things favorable about pharmaceuticals, and also not only to do that, but to criticize anything that competes with the pharmaceutical industry. And cannabis is a huge competition for big pharma. That was one of the reasons it was made effectively illegal in 1937 with the Marijuana Stamp Act. Our state voted for the Uniform Narcotic Act, and so should yours. To the Treasury agents of the Bureau of Narcotics comes the job of wiping out this traffic. And in 1937, we smashed 10 major narcotic rings. Only the cooperation of an awakened public can make, will make uh, the hell of it. The ladies crave, the country's rave is jive, jive, jive. This modern treat makes life complete. Jive, jive, jive. All the jive is gone. All the jive is gone. I'm sorry, Gabe, but you got And that's the reason today that it gets such a bad rap is it's a competition with Big Pharma. And Big Pharma has deep pockets. Any plant that carries a high medicinal state that's easily available to the consumer is a threat to our current industry. My industry of Western medicine, I was a part of it. I did drug development for many years in the chemotherapy environment and I can speak to that in saying that we are on a mission in the, in the Western medicine pharmaceutical model to find solutions to problems that have been caused by the environment. That business model, not even you know any, any conspiracy theory or anything here other than just raw business, that business model is challenged and threatened by any plant that now carries a high medicinal state that in its raw form with no processing whatsoever, with no fancy science, with no clinical trials, can bring relief and, from suffering to the individual on the other end of that plant. That is an inherent threat to that, that marketplace of a pharmaceutical industry. And so that's the, that's the reason why the juggernaut that's occurred in the, in the mass media and, and the science that gets, keeps being pushed out there about gateway drugs and all these things in the face of the largest opioid addiction that's ever happened in human history through the pharmaceutical industry. So it's in the face of every level of this business and business is business and we need to keep pushing the mighty dollar. You know, hemp gets a bad rap because of the pharmaceutical companies. You know, today, pharmaceutical companies and our medical system makes billions and billions of dollars today off of pain-killing drugs anti-anxiety medications, depression medications, and other medications. And so hemp and CBD are really a great solution for people to get off these drugs. And so the pharmaceutical companies are really fighting it hard. I think, you know, the corporate greed, I think the, you know, the, the big industries that make a lot of money out of pharmaceuticals don't want to see natural products come into the equation that are competitors that can't be patented. 
and with low side effect profiles with fantastic clinical outcomes. And we've seen it with Carver, we've seen it with St John's Wort. As soon as anything's really good, it gets slandered, it gets talked about in negative tones. Funny thing is hemp is not even psychoactive. It's not going to make you high like cannabis, but cannabis we know uh, that you can just see the, the scientific studies of the benefits of cannabis, but now look at hemp. Come on, Sessions knows marijuana isn't heroin because he's on record saying marijuana is only slightly less awful than heroin. It's true. They're very close. You take heroin, you die. Smoke marijuana, you will die laughing at Jeff Sessions. <laughs> One of the other issues is a lot of our government are investors into pharmaceutical companies, and so they're actually trying to keep cannabis and CBD from being legalized. But here's the truth. The people and chiropractors and doctors of functional medicine, they want cannabis and CBD for their patients. It's only a matter of time before the people break down those walls and cannabis and CBD is legal everywhere. The, the endocannabinoid system, it's only 20 years old. Like there's 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 still a lot more to discover. And the first place you should start with your human, human health is natural things. You shouldn't go straight off to a, you know, a, a pharmaceutical which might have fantastic benefits in the beginning but not long lasting you know, effects and even adverse effects later on. So you know, as a herbalist, I'm always gonna start and I'm always gonna recommend that people start off with a natural product. For these reasons, it takes a long time to turn the Titanic around but the consumer is always the agent of change. You guys are part of that change as consumers, as practitioners, as physicians and healers. You guys are part of this agency of turning that Titanic around. The money will be channeled in a more healthy, beneficial way. The money doesn't go away. Businesses are starting to see the writing on the wall and they're starting to diversify their portfolios. We have drug companies that are now making healthy granola bars to compete on the shelves of grocery stores because they see their bottom line waning quickly, disappearing as consumer demand goes the other direction. So keep demanding the opposite, keep demanding health from your food, keep demanding the ability to participate in a proactive fashion for your own health and healing. For more information about CBD, please visit us at innatehemp.com forward slash education.